so I'll, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to uh, start the, the session today. This is the third session of the Sao Paulo Advanced Studies School, uh, founded by FAPESP and organized by Maria, Maria Ermínia and, and Marta Machado. I would like to thank both of them for the wonderful job they, they did during the follow months. And also to uh, uh, thank the other people that were engaged and helped to make it a reality, like André, who's over there. Uh, so today is my uh, personal pleasure to welcome here uh, Margaret Keck, who is a reference in this study area of social movements and someone we have been reading for a long time. So Margaret Keck is professor emeritus of John Hopkins University, where she taught comparative politics, Latin American politics, and environmental politics. She is the author and co-author of numerous articles and four prize-winning books, including, I believe, the last book, um, Practical Authority, Agents, and Institutional Change in Brazilian Water Politics, with Rebecca Abers that just arrived here, and Green in Brazil, Environmental Activism in State and Society, together with Catherine Hotstetter, uh, and the works powering democratization in Brazil, a book that was uh, a landmark in those studies here in Brazil, and that appeared in 92. Uh, Professor Skag's research has always focused on activism and organization, in particular how organizers make creative use of, of unexpected opportunities. Uh, recent work on Brazilian water politics carried out together with other scholars in Brazil and, and US uh, focus on the micropolitics of institutional innovation. Uh, this, uh, this new book that I just referred together with Rebecca Abers builds on this research to ask how new institutions uh, that are supposed to administer important poli uh, policy changes acquire the authority on the, on the ground to do so. Uh, this book was awarded the 2014 Best Book Prize from the Brazil Session of the Latin American Studies Association, the 2014 Yale Fragrance Book Prize from the International Studies Association, the 2014 Giovanni Sartori Book Prize, uh, honorable mention for, from the qualitative and multi methods research section of the American Political Science Association, and the 2014 Roberto Reis Book Prize, honorable mention from the Brazilian Political Science Association. So she has more prizes than I can mention. <laughs> uh, we, we are very, uh, very happy to, to have her here because besides those uh, books. She authors also many articles on social movement dynamics, and I didn't mention here, but I'm going to mention this afternoon and tomorrow, another uh, book of her that's very important in Brazilian literature on social, on social movements, that is Activists Beyond Borders, a book that I, I believe is very influential in this uh, study area. So, uh, uh, I'd like to welcome you and to thank you for uh, coming here to discuss your work with us. Thank you. Hello. Does this work? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. It feels odd to be speaking English in, uh, in a Brazilian meeting. I think that actually this may be the first time I've ever done that. So. Um, if I talk too fast, please wave your hands in the air or something like that, and I will try and slow down. And if when we are in the process of having a discussion, 
if I ever manage to shut up and give you a chance. Um, if some people feel uncomfortable asking questions in English, um, please feel free to do it in Portuguese, and if there are people here who don't speak Portuguese, I'll translate it for them. Um, okay, so it's a huge pleasure and it's an honor to have been invited to speak at, at this conference of the uh, postdoctoral program of the Sao Paulo School of Advanced Studies, of which I had not heard um, prior to being invited, and so it's nice to find out what's going on uh, in Sao Paulo these days. I was invited to replace David Snow, who was unable to come at the last minute. Uh, those are very large shoes to fill, and I make no claim that I can actually fill them. Nonetheless, I'm very much, in, I, I was very much inspired, I have been very much inspired by Professor Snow's work in my own scholarship, and I'm inspired by his work as I frame this talk today around the idea of inhabiting borderlands. Interdisciplinary work is by definition borderland work, based on the claim that we have a lot to learn by reaching across the boundaries of our fields and across the kinds of categories that they recognize. The study of social movements by definition and in its historical development, also evokes borderlands. Social movements contest structures and they transform relationships. They reconfigure political territory. The study of social movements has helped keep alive in political science traditions of political sociology that many modern, so-called modern political scientists would have been happy to see disappear. I have always worked in borderlands. So what I have to offer in this talk today is not anything startlingly new. My comparative advantage here is not in being new, but rather the opposite. It's that I've managed to make it through an entire career and get old in this profession without ever having felt obligated to study something that I was not passionately interested in. I somehow managed to maintain slightly unconventional research agendas in political science departments at excellent universities for over 30 years, and I got away with it. So what I wanna do here today is to reflect on my years of working in the borderlands of political science outside the mainstream, but not always against the current, and to think about how building borderlands has sometimes changed the ways that borders are understood. David Snow, in his uh, fairly recent encyclopedia of political and social movements, um, refers to framing as signifying work of meaning construction engaged in by movement adherents, by which he means leaders, activists, uh, rank and file participants, and other actors, um, e.g. adversaries, institutional elites, media, social control agents, counter movements, relative to the interests of movements and the challenges they mount in pursuit of those interests. Now that sounds like a lot of stuff. Um, but essentially, this kind of signifying work is meant to change people's perceptions of the story in which they're involved. Um, it's, it's, a it's, it's a deliberate thing that social movement activists do, but it's also something that resembles in many respects what scholars do. Uh, what scholars do is reconfigure the story of what it is that we're writing about by understanding the relationship between events and people and structures in ways that they were not understood before. This is also a kind of framing. In what we study and in what we write, we draw upon our experiences, the things that shaped our 
personal trajectories, the things that shaped the kinds of questions that we decided to ask. Uh, we, take, uh, we develop relationships with mentors and with students and with co-authors and collaborators, and our exchanges with them shape us personally and intellectually as well. We take advantage of opportunities that we're offered. We move around, we take on projects, we invent new projects. Our disciplines provide us with tools, they constrain us, and they also challenge us to go deeper and further. Going deeper and further, we sometimes move into borderlands. By borderlands, and I'll illustrate this in a minute so that you understand a little bit better what I'm talking about. By borderlands, I understand the combination, the assemblages of human and, and uh, non-human elements that form clusters of activity around and across boundaries that might have been expected to keep them apart. I'm using the term very loosely. There, there are books written about borderlands and all kinds of theoretical approaches, and they don't, they're not all the same. I'm using the term very descriptively. It's a, it's, a working, it's a kind of a working definition for this talk. Disciplinary borderlands are constructed inside of and between academic disciplines. They also lie inside and between the way that we discipline ourselves, individually and collectively. There are virtual communities, our invisible universities, and our projects. They're, they're what allow us to look at what we have seen many times before and suddenly see something new. Um, once upon a time, before I started working on water politics in the project that uh, eventually led to the book that I wrote with Rebecca Abers. Um, uh, I used to look at rivers as lines on maps that separated people and land. Now, after 20 years of working on water, po water politics, I see them as connections between people and land. They're the, they're the things whose gravitational pull creates borderlands, and the resulting juxtapositions of previously unconnected things are what makes creativity possible. Of course, as we all know, the fact that something is possible does not mean that it's going to happen. That part takes a lot of work. I started out my career fairly clueless I didn't know at all what disciplinary borders were really about. Um, I started my, my first associations with political science were at the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium, where I was studying uh, international relations and public administration. I had done my undergraduate work in American history, as a matter of fact, um, a long time before that. So when I started a PhD program at Columbia in New York, um, I knew nothing whatsoever about the way that political science was structured in the United States because I had never actually studied it there. Um, I didn't know that international relations and comparative politics were supposed to be different. They were supposed to be different subfields. In some, in some of them you looked at foreign countries and in some you looked at what countries did in relation to each other. Uh, American politics, of course, was at the time the most parochial subfield in that the United States in those days was not supposed to be compared to anything at all. Um, although I had majored in US history as an undergraduate, I had been looking at the United States from abroad for five years. And so re-entry to the US and to the US Academy was not especially easy. Columbia was actually a good place for heterodox perspectives in those days. Uh, there were a lot of people around who had them. American politics was weak at Columbia in the 1970s. Political science was pretty international. And so it was okay to find the U.S. a little foreign, um, which I, in fact, did. 
My social networks and many of my academic networks as well were international and I couldn't really imagine them being different. So this was the first borderland, was finding that I shared with a lot of other people a privileged but slightly uncomfortable perspective that comes from being at home in many different places but not being entirely at home anywhere. What a friend of mine called being an international misfit. Um, that friend was eventually one of the people who became responsible for UN programs dismantling landmines under the Landmine Treaty. That's serious borderland work. Um, a more attractive term for this hybrid position that came into vogue later on was the notion of rooted cos cosmopolitans, but I always rather liked the title, the, the term international misfit. It had a kind of a, a, a nice ring to it. Um, okay, oddly enough, in those days during the early 1980s when I was in graduate school, the fact that the job market was truly awful um, somehow gave you more rather than less space to be unconventional, something that seems not to be the case um, today. There was no clear route to an academic job at the end of the line. Of the people who were in my original graduate school cohort, about half of them with whom I did coursework and took exams and, and, and wrote dissertation proposals and so on, about half of them dropped out either early on or, um, or before they wrote their dissertations. One got a PhD and then went to law school. I was kind of on the borderline, another borderline, but this was a borderline rather than a borderland. I finished graduate school precisely and exactly at the moment that the job market opened up again. So I was extraordinarily lucky. It was a very good lesson in the importance of, of being lucky, being prepared to be lucky, but nonetheless, um, the fact that contingency makes all the difference um, as, as we're going along. Um, although I had started Columbia without a commitment to actually finishing my PhD, at some point along the way I got hooked. And I became convinced by doing it that there actually was room in the academy to do serious scholarly work on things that I cared about a lot. So this was the second disciplinary borderland, which involved linking questions of scholarship with commitments in the world while respecting the integrity of both, something that's not always easy to do. This one involves self-discipline and a lot of ref reflexivity, and it's one that we don't really talk about nearly enough. This was and remains very tricky. I wrote my dissertation on the formation of the Workers' Party, the PT, in Brazil. Now, the PT occupied the presidency for 12 years and has become very controversial in all kinds of ways, and I'm not going to talk about any of that. Uh, and it looks a lot more like other Brazilian parties um, that, than it did then. And so it seems strange to think now about how risky a dissertation pro project this seemed like at that time. The party was only two years old when I started studying it. Um, and uh, a lot of people thought that I was crazy, that it was going to disappear momentarily, that this was clearly not a, an important political phenomenon, uh, that it certainly wasn't worth uh, a serious academic study, that no one would take me seriously, et cetera. Um, I had, however, I had become involved with human rights activism around labor issues um, after getting to know Latin American political exiles when I was living in Europe. Um, and therefore, I was aware of some of the early discussions about forming a political party, and I'd been following it from a distance. I had met a few of the party's founders when I was living in Europe. Um, I met other founders, including Lula, when I was helping to organize support among American trade unions for Brazilian labor leaders who were being persecuted under the national security law um, that was in force uh, during the military regime. 
So I had very good contacts for starting to study the PT um, when I did. And yet I also knew that there had to be a distinction between the kinds of research and writing that I did, in, that I was involved with in doing solidarity work, and the kinds of research and writing that I was going to do as a scholar, writing a dissertation. Uh, the questions had to be, and in fact, they were different. Obviously, um, in deciding to study the party at such an early stage, I was making a statement that I thought that it was important, that it was an important political phenomenon. Nonetheless, this was not a study that was intended to make it look good or look bad. Um, instead, I wanted to know how people organized it, what they were actually doing when they were organizing this political party, how under conditions that seemed extremely unfavorable, um, at least at the time. In retrospect, you, we can come up with all kinds of, of reasons why they were actually a lot more favorable than they looked then. But at the time, they looked extremely unfavorable. Um, how its founders and supporters build an organization and how they gradually transformed it into something with electoral clout. How did they recruit members? How did they build support? How did they mobilize resources? These are the kinds of questions that uh, in the social movement field people ask all the time. Here I was asking them both of the movements that made contributions to building the PT and also about the organization of the party itself. Could they change, could, could these party organizers change the widespread perception that the political game was re restricted to elites? and that nobody else could possibly possess the skills to play the game. And it's very hard for those who were not sort of alive and reading newspapers then um, to remember how extraordinarily denigrating the rhetoric was around, about the idea that workers could actually create a political party. It was, it was um, a sort of process of constant ridicule in, um, uh, in, in most of the mainstream press. And it was, it, it, it was a reflection of, of, of a level of, of political elitism that I had rarely encountered, and I sometimes found it um, truly bizarre. But in any case, were, would they be able to change that widespread, widespread perception? And so through the, through the lens of looking at um, the PT. I also hope to have something to say about what was still very much an unsettled democratization process to which all of the parties that were in the process of becoming organized um, during that period leading up to the 1982 and then 1985 elections um, were, all were, were contributing to that process. So in the end, this is what I have always studied. How people create new organizations and in doing so, try, not always successfully, um, to reshape the worlds in which they are organizing and doing politics. So organizing involves good parts and bad parts and ugly parts. So although I had a great deal of sympathy with the PT's project overall, it was my job in writing about it to be as clear-eyed as possible in the research that I did. Political science training then in qualitative quasi-ethnographic immersion was pretty weak, um, not to say non-existent. That was the sort of stuff that you learned in anthropology departments, occasionally in sociology departments, but not in political science departments. Um, and so navigating those boundaries between sympathies and, and um, intellectual discipline in the process of doing research was hard. Between research and friendly conversation, um, when, is, when is your friendly conversation a friendly conversation in which people are expecting that you keep confidential all the stuff that they're talking to you about? And when is it part of your research that's a legitimate uh, uh, thing that you can write about? How do you, how do you decide? How do you know? How do you draw those kinds of, of boundaries? This is something that people who do quasi-ethnographic fieldwork face all the time. 
it was hard and it was sometimes quite painful. Um, uh, because after all, you make friends, you build a life, uh, and uh, at the same time, you go home and you take a lot of notes and you try and figure out what it is that you're looking at. You don't want to use people. Um, and so you have to build relationships with others who are trying to work through the same thing. I was very fortunate at the time to be associated with a research, in Sao pa research institute in Sao Paulo with Sedeki, where uh, there were a lot of Brazilian scholars who were sympathetic to the PT and who were uh, essentially trying to figure out the same sort of thing. Um, so the dissertation took a lot longer to write than it would have had I not had to work so hard to achieve some critical distance on my subject matter. Um, but, and if I had not believed in the value of having done that. When the reviews of my book manuscript eventually came back, they were split between those who thought I was too nice to the PT and those who thought I was too mean to it. And so I figured I probably had done something more or less right. The thing is, that I got away with doing this. I got away with drawing on questions that came from my own political and social commitments and building with them research that I tried to give scholarly authority and that was able to acquire scholarly authority. I got a very good job when I got out of, of, of graduate school. I got a job at Yale. Um, and in 1986, when I started, it was a very dynamic period in political science. There were a lot of field boundaries that were getting redefined during that period. Um, uh, people like, at Yale, people like Jim Scott were showing that ethnographic field work could give us new perspectives on power. Uh, at the same time, people like Juan Lintz and David Apter were tending to what were still very expansive borderlands in political sociology, between political science and sociology. And political economy, which was mostly understood as the politics of economic and social relations in those days, still bridged most of the social science disciplines. In fact, the kind of work that I was doing actually passed for political economy in those days, um, something that in the social sciences um, is no longer true. The struggle, the struggle for definitional control over that piece of disciplinary territory and its gradual morphing into something that was more about economic approaches to politics um, is a really interesting episode in the discipline's history. Uh, and it's one I'm not going to go into here, but it's for those who are interested in the history of ideas, um, it's one that's actually um, interesting not to take for granted, but to understand as something that evolved um, over time. Uh, the desire to avoid it, in part, represents the only time that I ever decided um, it, 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 there's an irony here, because the research project that I actually came up with after I finished the PT book, um, and that I thought would be really worthwhile, was something that I had trouble making relevant to political science. Um, and therefore, I ended up abandoning it. It was meant to be a comparative study of inequality. Um, that it's, it's, I'm, I'm a little sorry I didn't do that. Um, other people, however, have done great work in this area, and obviously it's no longer something that's considered not terribly relevant um, to political science. But the battle for the soul of political economy is still going on, and it's been joined by people like uh, Vicky Murillo and Andrew Shank and Juan Pablo Luna, who've organized a hemispheric network of um, uh, called Repal, right? Um, that, that tries to uh, have a, to sort of rebuild a much more sort of Catholic sense of political economy as a broad borderland um, uh, rather than as, as being simply economic approaches to politics. Albert Hirschman, whose work is also enjoying a revival these days, 
Thanks in part to a great biography of him by Jeremy Edelman at Princeton would have been pleased. So as economic approaches to politics increasingly defined much of what was referred to as political economy in political science departments, what had begun as a borderland between economics and political science um, grew in different ways. It became common for political science departments to hire economists to teach political science and for techniques developed in, econ in economics to play a key role in political science methods as well. Um, and all of that moved away from the borders and into the center of the discipline. So the inhabitants of that particular borderland worked very hard and succeeded very well in their endeavors. However, as borderlands shift, previously disconnected clusters articulate research agendas of their own and built new borderlands that drew upon sociology, history, law, anthropology, and political theory. So an example of this is the development of constructivist IR, um, as, uh, as are other forms of, of critical and post-colonial um, international relations theory. Um, research on social movements and contentious politics during this period defended a space in the discipline for political sociology at a time in which uh, it was diminishing in other parts of the discipline. Um, studies of organizations and bureaucracies have also defended space um, for political sociology, as has in the United States um, the field of American political development, which is a, a, a much sort of broader, more Catholic approach, uh, or Catholic in the sort of general sense, um, more multidisciplinary approach to thinking about the history of American politics. It seems to me important to see these not as crossing disciplinary lines, or not only as crossing disi disciplinary lines, but as imagining and building disciplinary borderlands from inside by inhabiting them, by taking over territory, by building discussions and debates, by creating new kinds of questions, and asking them in conjunction with people who are not necessarily from the same field um, in which you yourself studied. By asking new questions and by answering them, we can build new theoretical and conceptual spaces and not just fight over how to arrange the old ones. So let me give a couple of examples from my own. Uh, all right, I, for, I forgot about my PowerPoints there. So they've been kind of zipping along here. Um, I, have, I, I, I have here sort of the list of, of, of books that, um, that Angela referred to at the beginning. She, what she didn't refer to is the fact that two of these books exist in translation in, into Portuguese, which is important. Um, the first one being the, the Workers' Party book, which came out in Brazil as PT a Lógica da Diferencia in 1991. And the second being Practical Authority, which came out um, in Brazil this past month um, from Fio Cruz and is called Autoridade Prática Ação Criativa e Mudança Institucional na Política das Águas do Brasil, uh, co-authored with Rebecca Ebers, who is sitting right there. Um, okay, but let me, let me go back to, let me just give a few examples of the kinds of questions that required um, thinking across disciplinary boundaries in the process of writing some of, the, of, of some of the work that I've done. When I first started working on the PT and, on, and in particular on the PT's relationship with different kinds of social movements, um, both those that pre-existed it and those that were created after, um, after the party, I was very, con very concerned with, interested in, worried about the question of social movement autonomy. This is something that we thought about a lot um, at that period. And it was important in Brazil because coming out of a long history of corporatist tradition, 
Um, the concern was to what extent are social movements able to act autonomously from the state or and from different kinds of relationships with the state. This was obviously tremendously important with the labor movement, which was, was thoroughly imbricated with the state, but it was important also with regard to uh, to other kinds of, of, of local movements. With the, with the PT emerging in the, in the midst of this organizational stew, I guess you could say, there was a lot of concern among people who were discussing it about whether this kind of dependence of movements on the state would then become a dependence of movements on a political party instead, whether it would simply be a kind of a, a transfer of dependence or whether there was actually something going on, something different, something, um, something uh, really being built from below in the, the sort of mushrooming of different kinds of social movements around Brazil during that period. And so I was looking for evidence of separation. I was looking for boundaries, which were sometimes difficult to find because the fact is that when we're looking at the relationships among organizations, we very often can't draw rigid boundaries. And the process of trying to find them eventually began to seem like a kind of a, uh, a quick, not just a quixotic effort, sort of a waste of time. Because what, was, what became really interesting over the course of doing all of this was not so, much as, not so much what categories things fell into and what sort of, what separated them, but what different kinds of relationships were being built. And what was the content of those relationships? How did the relationships change? How did, the, how did, how did who was part of the relationships change? Um, how did how did how to how to think about what's the relationship between um, was was the party a party of movement or was it a movement party or was it a movement taking was it a party taking advantage of movements or was it a party that created movements it was in fact all of those things were going on uh, and all of those things were going on at the same time more important it it became more important for me eventually to try and map things than it was to try and classify them. And, I, and, and so this, this was the beginning of, of a kind of a shift in the way in which I thought about categories and the way that I really thought about politics was uh, from that time on uh, moving in a much more relational direction um, than I had been before. Uh, Angela said that she's going to talk more about Activists Beyond Borders, and so I will only talk a little bit about it here. Um, this is one where we really did move into uh, serious borderland construction. Um, this is another case in which, in which experience influenced the kinds of questions that were being asked. Uh, and the kind of subjects that were being researched um, on the part of both my co-author, Catherine Sickink, and myself. Both of us had been involved in uh, different kinds of, of organizations whose membership uh, and whose contacts crossed borders. I had been involved in a variety of things having to do with labor solidarity that involved uh, people in Latin America, in the United States, in Europe, and, and, and uh, Catherine had been involved in human rights organizations and had been very involved in the organization of, um, of the campaign to uh, stop Nestle from selling, uh, from trying to foist uh, 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 form infant formula onto women who ought to be feeding their babies with breast milk. It was, it was sort of generally known as the, the, uh, the Nestle boycott. Uh, it was a campaign that created a very large international boycott that eventually caused Nestle to, uh, that, that actually successfully caused Nestle to change 
its marketing strategies in developing countries. So these were, so both of us had 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 this kind of instinctive understanding that that there was politics going on in these kinds of international relations that had nothing to do or very little to, it wasn't that they had nothing to do with states but they had very little to do with states they involved all different kinds of actors they involved organizations they involved international uh, agencies they involved uh, people from different UN organizations they involved other countries uh, foreign affairs ministries um, and we had nothing in our uh, arsenal of social science theory that helped us very much in discussing these kinds of activities. Um, the solution for most social scientists was they aren't important. If we don't have the tools to talk about them, that must mean they're not important, and so, um, so we don't have to talk about them. Um, the problem is that we weren't convinced of that. Uh, we weren't convinced that they weren't important, and we decided that what we really needed to do uh, was we needed to uh, set out and start to create some of those tools. And you're going to have to give me a, a second now, because in the process of going a little bit off track, I proceeded to lose my place. Okay. Found it. So I knew Catherine quite well because she, Catherine Sikink was in the cohort um, right behind me at Columbia, and we got to know each other in a group of, of graduate students who worked on Latin America, um, and also through other mutual friends who worked on um, human rights issues with regard to Latin America. Then I got to know her better when she was in New Haven for a year um, because her, um, during my first year of teaching. Catherine was deeply committed to human rights, but was also fascinated with the power of ideas um, to persuade and motivate and stir action. And so that led her to her first book, which was on actually the idea of developmentalism in Brazil and Argentina. And um, so we, we shared these kinds of interests, but we, but we also shared a healthy curiosity about peop how people organize and build networks. We knew about networks. We had been part of networks. We had instinctive feels for networks, but we didn't know anything about networks in, in a more sort of sociological um, sense of the term. We noticed in her research, in the research that she had begun to do on the politics of human rights, and research that I had begun to do on environmental politics, um, we, be we began to notice that there were similar patterns of transnational interaction between her human rights activists and between my tropical forest activists. Um, they were doing things that, that looked a lot the same. And so we decided to try writing a paper. So we worked with um, Alison Brisk to organize a panel of the American Political Science Association on transnational relations, but the panel didn't fit into, into any of the APSA section slots. There was no place in the categories that were available um, at APSA for a panel on transnational relations. It was rejected by both comparative politics and by international relations sections. Um, Catherine contacted Peter Katz Nelson, who was co chair of the APSA program, and explained the problem. And because Peter and Mary Katzenstein had a couple of extra sort of theme panels in their back pockets um, to allocate, and they had one left, they gave it to us. I remember it was a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, it was the last day of the conference, and the room was full. People were really interested. Um, and they recognized what we were talking about. So we were very encouraged. We revised our paper. Um, we had very good comments from our APSA discussant, and we submitted the article to World Politics. Uh, there was skepticism on the part of the readers, um, but there was one detailed and extremely helpful review uh, and a revise and resubmit. So, we, uh, the helpful review wanted us to add more cases, to 
go into more detail with some of the, um, um, the theorizing that we were trying to do about transnational activism. Um, uh, it took us about a year to do that, but we did it, so we resubmitted it. And this time, um, they rejected it outright. Um, they brought in several new reviewers, and they all agreed, this is not political science. So we persisted. We revised it again, and we sent it to another journal. That time, um, in, for all of you who are students thinking about sending out articles, be encouraged here. A lot of people have gotten rejected at some point or another um, in, the, in, in their long processes. So we sent it out to another journal. We got another revise and resubmit, we got, in which one reviewer suggested that we change it into a rational choice framework. Um, and the other said it read like a book introduction rather than like an article. So we decided that the first one was ridiculous and the second one was probably right. If it read like a book in introduction, maybe it should be a book introduction. And so we decided um, to write a book. Um, in the process, we made a number of important decisions about how we wanted to write this book. Um, and, and these are decisions, uh, uh, I guess you could say, these are decisions about building borderlands. Uh, we were definitely, we were not just border, bo on the border, we were marginal um, at, at that point in this process. We decided that we were not writing the book for the people who were already convinced. Um, even though we were very glad of their company. We were writing it for people who believe that international relations involved interactions between powerful political and economic actors and that politics involves competition or collaboration among clearly identifiable and in fact already identified categories of actors. So that meant that instead of situating our argument um, in mainly in relation to critical IR scholars who we knew would be supportive, um, we tried to situate it in relation to the mainstream. We were also addressing political sociologists who studied movements and organizations because we found a lot of the literature on um, social movements extra extraordinarily useful in trying to understand how transnational networks tried to build um, political space for themselves um, for the kinds of causes that they were advancing. The idea, therefore, was not to cut ourselves off from these currents of scholarship, but build bridges to them. We were ignoring the boundary between comparative politics and international relations, something I had never believed in very much in, in the first place. Um, but one of us had training, had our, our doctoral training in IR, and one of us had our doctoral training in comparative politics, and we very happily trespassed in each other's fields. Um, we focused on how people organize. We were also arguing that networks connect actors inside and outside of states, but we didn't entirely get that one across, um, since most people did did read the book as a book that was talking about states being irrelevant and, and uh, transnational actors being mostly non-state actors. It's not actually what we were saying. We actually did say that, that transnational networks involve uh, people from inside of states as well, but you can't always make all of your points as well as the others. Um, and we were also exploring uh, the political role of professional non-governmental organizations, something that, that was still relatively novel in political science. Um, there's a whole sort of industry of NGO studies that, that, that took place essentially um, in, other, in other fields, and mostly in sort of nonprofit management schools and things like that. But, uh, but, but how exactly these organizations operated politically was something that we were trying to tackle. We were very explicitly trying to expand and bridge what were still very constrained disciplinary spaces and increase 
the ex increase the expanse of a kind of interactive world politics that included both conventional and unconventional actors, um, and a world politics in which domestic and international politics were interwoven. We were not the first to do that, but we were quite consciously trying to populate and inhabit that kind of space. Um, we deliberately sought reactions and criticisms from pe people that we thought would be skeptical, and we were lucky to get them. Um, Robert Cohane organized a really useful seminar that essentially dismantled parts of our manuscript at Harvard, and we had to put it back together again. Uh, Sidney Tarot gave us great comments and became convinced that social movement theories are actually uh, actually travel a lot better than he had originally expected. A lot of people commented on it. Um, and, uh, and an editor at Cornell University Press, Roger Hayden, um, was encouraging from the very beginning and encouraged us, even as we were trying to develop new the theoretical ideas, encouraged us to tell a lot of stories encouraged us to try and get through the ideas in the, that we were trying to develop by, making, by bringing them alive to people um, with the idea that that would, uh, uh, that, that, would, th that would serve us well in trying to build these borderlands. And it was very good advice. Um, Okay. So once again, we're working at the intersection of commitments in the world and a strong belief that we would serve those commitments best by writing a good scholarly book. And this meant building in distance between the process of writing, writing the book and the commitments that had awakened our interest. Um, that we, commitments that we didn't hide, um, but nonetheless, um, that we tried very hard to discipline. We were in very good company. The borderlands that we were trying to expand were already being built by a number of other people, um, like Alison Brisk working on indigenous politics transnationally, Audie Klotz, who was working on um, global anti-apartheid movements, um, Martha Finnamore, Cecilia Lynch. In fact, it's really interesting how many of the people doing this work were women, just to note. Um, uh, and a number of others. Um, we also managed, in so doing, to create a lot more interaction between scholarly, the, the building scholarly ideas in this area and the actual organizations that were, um, that were doing this kind of work. And one of the things that we were most proud of actually was when Amnesty International started assigning our book in its, in, in, in its training workshops. We thought that was extraordinarily cool. Um, the final set of borderlands that I want to explore is uh, one that is constituted by networks of interaction that crisscross state agencies and organizations of different kinds in civil society. Um, and this is something that Rebecca Abers is going to talk more about when she talks about her own work, because she actually works on this a lot, uh, and she'll be talking about that tomorrow. But one day, one day when I was working on the uh, environmental politics project that I haven't really talked about, and I was puzzling over something at my desk, a little voice spoke in my head. It's, it's not, the, you should listen to these little voices when they occasionally appear. And it said, the state is a job. And I sort of said, what's that about? And I realized that at night, the people who work in jobs in the state go home. And they belong to churches, and they belong to neighborhood associations, and they belong to uh, other kinds, uh, they, they belong to environmental associations, they, they're involved with their neighbors in all kinds of other ways that have nothing to do with the, what they do during the day as people who are in the state. And this silly little phrase 
opened up for me somehow the understanding that once again, the kind of rigid categorical line that I had been drawing between state and civil society simply didn't work. The environmental organization, when I first started working on environmental organizations, I thought that I was working on social movements that were, that were contesting state policy and were building contentious uh, networks and that were going to try, were trying to influence the state from the outside. And I wrote an entire book manuscript based on this idea and got to the end of it and realized that it was really wrong. That wasn't what they were doing. It was part of what they were doing. But a large part of what they were doing, actually, was some of them were getting jobs in the state. Uh, some of them were getting funding from the state to do environmental education. Um, and a lot of them were going into state offices and were trying really hard to put pressure on state employees, many of whom were their friends, um, to adopt certain kinds of policies. And they were also trying to help the state carry out policies that uh, environmental agencies were finding it extraordinarily difficult to carry out themselves. Those kinds of activities challenge these sorts of categorical boundaries that I had always put, that I had always taken for granted, in fact, because we talk all the time about how, oh, well, there's a state and there's a civil society, and it's really important for the civil society to sort of build, build capacity and so on and so forth. But looking at what happens actually in the interstices of state and civil society suddenly became, um, became much more interesting. So I put that manuscript in a drawer. And fortunately, Kathy Hofstetler had done something sort of similar and also had a manuscript that she put in a drawer. And one day, the two of us ran into each other in the Sao Paulo airport um, on our way back to the United States and sat together and decided that we would attempt a merger between our two books, but make it right this time. And so essentially, we ended up writing what was effectively an entirely new book, which was partly about environmental organizations, but was also partly about how these, these kinds of interactions um, developed. Um, that the, thinking about those kinds of interactions um, is something that I then um, did much more in the last project that I did together with Rebecca Abers, um, with whom I'm going to be on a panel tomorrow, and it's going to be very hard because, frankly, I don't know if I have any ideas in the last 10 years that are not also Rebecca's ideas um, because of the fact that we've worked together um, so much on this. And we'll talk, we'll talk, I'll talk more about that project um, in the part uh, tomorrow. The, the main point, though, with regard to that project was that we, we, we were supposed to be studying the development of, of a collaborative governance process in river basins where you had a variety of, of organizations and institutions from states and civil societies that were going to collaborate with each other and resolve problems. And we discovered that a lot of the components of this collaborative process um, simply didn't exist. Either they existed only on paper, or uh, they just didn't work. Um, and that in order to build these new kinds of arenas, these new kinds of collaborative spaces, these new kinds of borderlands, um, the organizers were going to have to find ways of building the things that were going to be coordinated um, at the same time as they were trying to coordinate them. In the same way that long ago, um, the PT sometimes found itself in a position of trying to stimulate the creation of social movements whose voices it wanted to amplify. And in the same way that in numerous, okay, I'm actually coming to an end. Um, numerous other organizations um, have done the same. So, if there's a lesson to draw from all of this, it's that we make disciplinary borderlands by inhabiting them, um, by tending to them, by attracting others to them, by creating debates in them, and uh, 
these kinds of conferences and organizations have always been a part of the process of doing that, um, sharing, uh, sharing ideas across disciplinary borders, sharing ideas across national borders, across languages, and so on. So thank you very much for listening as I sort of go on and on and on. Um, keep on thinking about this stuff, keep on organizing, and have a good rest of the week. I was, I was actually going to show one slide from Activists with Beyond Borders, which is, is, is a lesson for all students. If you put a good graphic in your work, people will cite it. This is the most, this is the only graphic in Activists Beyond Borders, and this is the most cited page in the entire book. I will show it tomorrow. <laughs> okay. uh, I want to close this, and it's a PC rather than a Mac. Are you done? Okay. Ooh, I did it. <laughs> uh, so um, I'd like to, to thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's very interesting for us here in this kind of school to have this um, trajectory of uh, different research investigations of uh, different subjects and how you, um, I, I think it's, it's especially good to the students to hear how sometimes we are wrong, and yeah? when we we change pace, when we change subjects, when we change theories, because sometimes uh, when the books are done, we have this uh, impact of something that was very well constructed, very, um, and that was conceived in that way since the very beginning, right? So it was very very nice to to hear to you today. Uh, I'd like to uh, to make one um, question that I think it's in order to complement what you said, but I, I will do it and and just open the the floor. I get something to write with. Sure, I can. I. Não tem o caderninho? Papelzinho não. No, I have paper, I need it. Oh. So, um, you, 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 you did that long uh, trajectory description, and, and I think that you, you uh, went through many different subjects in, in, our, in your career and your um, collaborations, but I'd like to, to uh, ask you to, to talk a bit about the contemporary agenda in this field, because as you said, you, uh, you have been part of this construction of a kind of political sociology field. I think you were very important more than you uh, stressed here in your presentation in, in, in doing that. And so I'd like to, to hear a, a little about what do you think are the important issues uh, uh, in, in, inside this agenda nowadays, what the new students should uh, address in their uh, works? But now I can open and, and take uh, three um, people in the audience, for instance, and then Mimi can ask, can answer. There's someone there. First of all, actually, is there anyone in the room who doesn't understand Portuguese? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we have That's some, okay. We have some international students. Okay. Well, thank you very much. My name is Clancy Bonilla. I'm from Guatemala. Uh, currently, I'm doing my postdoc, my postdoctoral um, research in University of Campinas. And I found uh, your um, participation very um, helpful for me. I'm coming out of a kind of um, academic identity crisis <laughs> and um, I ended up landing in a place where I finally f felt welcomed. My um, undergraduate studies were in law 
and everybody was classifying me because I got my degree as a lawyer. Then I moved to economics, and now I'm a try, I'm in an interdisciplinary world in um, the School of um, Applied Social Sciences of Unicamp. So I wonder what's your opinion about academic credibility because that's what I was concerned about. When somebody tracked my trajectory or my interest and so first regulations and commercial law, for example, then moved away to economics of development and now um, doing research in political, political science but also involving sociology, which is um, technology and uh, science public policy for economic development. So I wonder about this, this situation, credibility, that people will see that I'm jumping, not keeping really consistency or coherence. Thank you. Another one here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the very inspiring talk. Um, I was just wondering when you were doing your research on uh, social movements, in if you um, got to work with think tanks in the US, for instance, because they think that um, sort of their independent position is sort of interesting to look at. Think yeah, in general. So I Thank you. I think you can take those three and then we open another round, okay? okay. Yeah. Well, the first one, what do I think is important in political sociology today is a in the agenda. really <laughs> big question. <laughs> Let me take the other ones first. Um, the problem of field jumping is one of those things that depends a lot on where you are. It's, a, it's much more common in the United States, for example, um, than it is in, a country, in countries where you basically need to have the same credential for a long period of time. So, you know, in, in Brazil, you can't be a journalist unless you went to journalism school, whereas in the US, you can be a journalist if you can get somebody to publish your articles. Um, my husband has, a, has an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in social sciences and Latin American studies and made a career uh, doing bioinformatics at the National Cancer Institute um, because of the fact that he basically is kind of self-taught in informatics and also uh, sort of medical content. And so, so it, that's not as easy today in the U.S. either as it used to be, but nonetheless, the U.S. The US is, is a little bit more forgiving of the idea that people might change fields and it might not mean that there's something wrong with them. Um, so, it, it, it's, so my point is kind of I'm not sure. I, I, I feel as though, generally speaking, credibility is... The, the closer you are to school, the more your credibility depends on where you're coming from in terms of, of your, your, your degrees. Uh, and the further you are away from it and the more that you've accomplished, in the meantime, if you've managed to find a place that lets you do that accomplishing, um, then uh, the more that your credibility is, is essentially built on what you've actually accomplished. So, I, I don't know that that's at all, at all a helpful answer. Um, one of the things that I found, it took me a long time to realize that I was always working on the same thing. I actually, you know, when I, for a long time, when people ask me, well, why you worked on the PT, labor and the PT, and now you're working on environmentalists, why, why did you make such a huge leap? And, my, my original answer to that was a little awkward. It was sort of, well, I was always really interested in the fact that you had this kind of tension 
and and negotiation of ideas between um, between environmentalists and uh, people who were more interested in in uh, material social issues in the PT, and so that got me interested in it. But that wasn't really the thread. I mean, that might have been one of the things that pushed me in that direction. But the fact is, I always worked on organizers. In everything that I've ever worked on, I've worked on how people understand the, the opportunities around them, what they're trying to do to actually seize those opportunities, how they organize, how they try and acquire influence. I mean, it's gone straight through every single project that I've ever been involved in. But I didn't really see that until much later. Retrospect is, hindsight is 2020, as they say. In other words, you can see much better looking backwards sometimes than looking forward. But one of the things that, to some extent, you have to try and trust your instincts. And then you have to convince people around you that your instincts make sense. Um, that's framing. Um, think tanks. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean. Have I had contact with think tanks? I mean, I have had. I have. I, I had a fellowship at the Woodrow Wilson Center for a year. Um, I know people in some think tanks when I was working on environmental politics. I certainly interviewed people at think tanks, but I'm not sure what you're trying to. Ask about. Um, depends on the kind of social movement. Certainly, think tanks, some, think, some kinds of think tanks or non governmental organizations that, that are sort of like think tanks. It, there, there's a let, let's, let's get definitions sort of provisional definitions clear here, because the line is not rigid um, between advocacy NGOs and think tanks. Um, think tanks generally have a research agenda um, and that is, that, that sometimes expands, sometimes contracts, generally has a point of view so you could say, for example, in the United States that the Heritage Foundation is a conservative think tank and the Brookings Institution is a liberal think tank and, and you know, there are, there, there are a whole range of, of other ones. Then there are, are professional non-governmental organizations with staffs and research capacities that uh, like resources for the future or environmental defense or, or whatever that that, that are really advocacy organizations in many respects, more than the think tanks are. So there are connections, but they, have, they play different kinds of roles. Certainly when I was working on, uh, in particular when I was working on the kinds of environmental advocacy efforts that involved um, trying to get large international organizations to influence what governments did in areas like forest policy, um, uh, fisheries policies, and things like that. Um, you, you have had, in, at, on many occasions, the involvement of people from think tanks, at least, not necessarily a position by the organization. And one of the things that happens in all of these kinds of networked policy areas is that you have individuals from organizations that play important roles but are not necessarily committing their organization to a particular position. Uh, political sociology. Golly, you know, I, 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 um, I don't know that I feel that I'm really in a position to 
to, to, to talk very much about this. I mean, I think there's a lot of really interesting, because in part because I, I follow very um, narrow streams of it. I mean, I, I think that a lot of the kinds of uh, work that some of the, that people like Anne Mish do, um, and you've co-authored with her as well, um, on sort of reflexivity and, and projectivity and so forth is really interesting. Um, I think that there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot of work in um, uh, organizational sociology that I find interesting. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't. I don't actually feel qualified to make to to. Let me rephrase my this. my 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 question. I'm not a sociologist. Besides. No, no. That's, that's the reason I'd like to rephrase. Uh, I'd like to ask you about which subjects do you think are worth to study from your point of view nowadays. What what subjects are worth studying? Yeah. Oh well, how to keep the world from blowing itself up might be nice. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that that there's a lot of work that needs to be done that is really, really, really hard to do on um, on violent networks, for example, um, which is horrifically difficult to do and dangerous. Uh, but if we don't understand how they work, um, if if insofar as people don't understand how they work, then how, how on earth are we going to find ways of, of um, combating them? And I don't mean sort of just going in and stationing troops in the middle of, of, of cities. That's not, that's, not how, that's not how it's going to work. You can't unravel networks just by sort of waving guns around. Um, so those kinds, and the other thing that I think is absolutely crucial is, uh, insofar as the the nature of of production um, and service provision changes to require less and less human labor, um, how are we going to organize societies in which people still can um, survive. Economies, after all, maybe to, to have economies thriving uh, as people become uh, more and more marginal to those economies doesn't make a whole lot of sense in a lot of ways. But that is what we're seeing. And those seem to me to be really essential questions. Oh, yes. Thank you. So now, uh, another, another question Hi. over there, Umberto. Okay. Well, good morning. Thanks so much. I'm Umberto. I have a doctoral research here in Sebrapi. And I'm, I'm particularly interested to talk about this agenda of research on the interaction between political party and social movements, because it's, that's, that's a research that I did during my PhD. Uh, but I think in some way we are more uh, inclined or have a Tense. So it works. We have some tense to um, uh, this develop the research, uh, taking consideration practically the leftist party. I mean, as you said, uh, some leftist party that create movement that have interaction with the militants, etc. Uh, and obviously, uh, some categories like autonomy, interaction, agenda, overlapping militants is important to understand this this direction. But what happening if we consider some agenda, including uh, right parties? I mean, in Brazil right now, we are seeing different uh, militants that Not inside PSI, the Bay, et cetera. So if you can tell us about it, it would be interesting. Thanks. I think it's super important. Hi. Uh, my name is Daniela. I'm from Unicampi. I would like to know, uh, thinking about networking and framing and thinking about your first, first thought of studying inequality, what do you think would have been uh, the boundary in inhabiting and the questions about inequality when you first thought of studying inequality? And what do you think would be now? And Sergio. 
Yeah, uh, please apologize me if you has already um, explained this point in the first five minutes of your presentation. I was in the wrong venue, so I uh, didn't get the first uh, five minutes. It's on the concept uh, borderland, and I'm uh, also have a special interest in this concept since I'm supervising a doctoral dissertation on the borderland, using the concept borderland to study the f uh, border between uh, Brazil and French Guiana, which is quite interesting because it's the border between Latin America and Europe. So, uh, but um, at the end of the day, I, di I don't get really the specificity of this concept of borderland. It's sometimes it seems to me very uh, unspecific in that sense that you find borderlands everywhere. Mm -hmm. In the examples you mentioned, the borderlands between human and unhuman, even in this protect space here, this could be a, a borderland since uh, we have a contact between human and unhuman actors in this room, even in our body. So, uh, you know, I, I don't get the specificity of the concept. Uh, from another perspective, I think there are also under, so to say, competitors, such as figuration, as coined by Norbert Elias, understood as um, transnational web of uh, interdependence or contact zone, uh, Pratt, or also transnational spaces, uh, translocal spaces as coined by authors such as Pries or glickler -Schiller. So the question would be, what is really specific in the, conce in the concept of borderland that you can really define some regions or some uh, web of relations in our complex societies, which are borderlands um, in, contrast, in contrast to other regions, which are not borderlands. So, actually, uh, I did in the first five minutes say that I was using it in a purely descriptive and non-theoretical way. Um, so, uh, which in a sense, is, uh, is, is, you are pointing out that I was doing that, and you're quite right, I was. Um, there is, in fact, a, there, are, there are lots of really interesting literatures um, that address all of those kinds, all of the kinds of things that you were talking about. There's a, there's a uh, with regard to your, the, your Brazil Guiana um, uh, borderlands case, one of the things that actually first drew me to the notion in terms of geography is that there's a lot of very interesting literature on, uh, what, on, on interactions at the U.S.-Mexican border that, that speaks very much about that as, as a borderland. And, and there, the borderland is, is really, it's, it's like, it's not just the U.S. and just Mexico, it's its its its, it's, its own kind of social and political space that is built out of those those kinds of interactions. Um, uh, in relation to human and non-human, um, I just spent the last 20 years at Johns Hopkins where the, the where Jane Bennett and various other political theorists are working um, very very vigorously on on the question of, of of materiality and 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 the relationship between human and non-human. There's a lot of really really interesting stuff um, to get into here. I wasn't trying to get into it all, and I wasn't act, and I was using it in a very loose and very descriptive manner, um, basically opportunistically, you might even say, um, in order to 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 organize the to use it to so, sort of organize the idea that both that that in in geographical space and in interdisciplinary space and in intellectual space and space between experience and and production that you know uh, we can think of we can think of that as as the construction of a of, of a set of, of borderlands but not i but but i wouldn't go out on a long theoretical limb um, about it. I can't really answer the question about how I would have constructed a, 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 a project on, any, on inequality because I didn't get very far. 
people kept discouraging me from doing it, and I stopped. Um, but it, you know, one of the, it, it seemed clear um, that I had been working on Brazil. Brazil was a country that was sort of uh, clearly where inequality, both in a social, political, and economic sense, um, sort of cried out to you all over the place. I, the United States is also a country where uh, extreme inequalities, uh, although they're more hidden, um, are nonetheless uh, really fundamental. And it seemed, it seemed as though there was an absence of a lot of, there was an absence of very much comparative work on, on inequality. There's a lot more now, I'm glad. Um, I didn't do it, and I didn't entirely frame it, and so I can't answer how I would have done it um, then. Um, I do. I think it's tremendously important for people to do more work on the right. I think that uh, you know, it's the point that a lot of the people who've worked on the relationship between political parties and social movements have been on, have have been looking at the left and have been influenced by ideas on the left and so on and so forth, is extremely well taken. Um, there are exceptions, but nonetheless, there are, there are way too few exceptions, and there needs to be a whole lot more. Um, both paying attention to the kinds of ideas that inspire people and also to the ways, the kinds of organizational networks that are built and how, and, and what people decide to do with them. Um, and uh, I totally applaud um, efforts to build work in that area. Okay. Here now. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Douglas. I'm from Foundation School of Sociology and, Pol and Politics of Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm graduating in international relations and social sciences, and I made my final paper in international relations based on the influence of uh, transnational advocacy uh, in the LGBT movement, and uh, mixing with the queer theory. So, I, I love your work. <laughs> Thank for the the lecture, and I'd like to ask you if uh, transnational advocacy could have a place in matters of security or national security in cases, for example, uh, as organized crimes, uh, such as cartels in Mexico. Marta? Just complementing your, your last answer, I'm doing, I'm studying pro-life and pro-family activism in, in Brazil. And I find your work extremely useful to analyze them. So would you, you and you were not thinking about the right wing activists when you when you wrote that. Do you think we would we would need some caveat or adaptation to use your work just to the right wing movement? Someone else? Oh. Well, hi, good morning. Um, well, in your presentation, you talked a little bit about the relation between experience and researching. Uh, this is a very controversial issue in this field, right? If we're studying social movements or politics, uh, and there are many different positions about it, about how we use our personal experiences or even our political views. Uh, how do we get inspired or about our personal experiences in political activism to study them, um, how do we make this distance between the researcher and the activists? Um, how do we play that role? Uh, so I would like you to comment a little bit more about this because I think that especially here most people are studying contemporary issues, contemporary uh, social movements, so, and, and this is something very hard to do, so. I would like to, to comment this, please. Please. I'm going to do these in reverse order. I never uh, attempted to do an academic study of a social movement in which I was personally involved. I was friends with people who were involved in, in some of the 
in, in many of the activities that I studied. But I never tried to write about a movement in which I was personally very, very invested. Uh, and I think that, that, that there it would have been very hard to build in enough, um, enough distance. I do, however, think that it's, poss it's possible to study movements with which you sympathize in a serious way. But you have to believe, I think, I mean, in order to have it turn into scholarship and not just sort of apologism, um, you have to believe that there is something useful um, about for those to, with whom you sympathize um, in having a really clear-eyed view of what's going on. And you have to be willing to have people be mad at you. I mean, you, 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 you just have to be, you, you have to, if, if, you're, if you essentially are afraid that, that, that your friends are all going to really be pissed off at you if, you if you do a solid piece of, if you find stuff that is uh, ugly and you write about it, then you shouldn't do that kind of work. Um, you know, I, I remember when I was writing the book on the PT, um, there was a great deal of incompetence going on in the, in the PT uh, City Hall in Diadema, which is something on which I did a fairly extensive case study. And there were numerous people who said to me at the time, you really shouldn't write about this. You know, this, this is this is not this is not it's not supportive. It's 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 not it's not supportive of our struggle and so on and so on and so forth. Um, but I couldn't do that because I had made this commitment already um, to 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 do a serious piece of work, and that meant that um, I thought. I actually believed, and I still believe, that it was important for PT organizers, too, that I do serious work, and that I not just sort of write everything's fine and hunky-dory. And as a matter of fact, there were a number of them later who, who agreed with me, but not necessarily at that, at that moment. So, I mean, it's hard. You have, to, you have to figure out what your own capacities are, what how the kinds of relationships that you have in your life uh, are going to be affected and are going to affect your work. And, and then you have to, you know, talk to other people too to sort of get, get some good advice. But, but there, you can't, um, there's only so distant you can make yourself from things that you're really, really close to. Um, so, uh, National security issues. Um, it's most most of the um, kinds of advo advocacy activities that we studied in Activists Beyond Borders. Um, there were many of them that had national security implica implications of different kinds, but they weren't. Uh, they didn't involve uh, major national security related actors in, in, in these particular kinds of struggles that we dealt with. There are lots of other people who have written about things I think that are closer to what you're talking about. I mean, the, one of the things that I'm most proud of in Activists Beyond Borders is that it has prompted a lot of people to do a lot of really good research afterwards. Uh, we wrote that book 20 years ago. And in the 20 years since then, you know, it's not like we've, it, there was just us and then everybody just kept following us. In the 20 years since then, there have been hundreds 
and hundreds and hundreds of studies by other people, many of them wonderful studies by other people that have built on aspects of our argument, that have modified aspects of our argument, that have challenged aspects of our argument, that have said that we were just sort of wrong uh, on some things that have said, and, the, and one, of the, one of the main things that, that we were critiqued on was that the people that we wrote about were all nice. Um, that, that we didn't write about, about, we didn't write about violent networks, we didn't write about, um, we, didn't, we didn't write about networks uh, that had harmful impacts potentially and so forth. There were reasons for that and there was also, you know, there's just, you can't write about everything. Um, and, there, and, and because of the fact that we p were putting so much emphasis in the argument of that book on information politics, which is primarily a process of opening up information, um, we thought that the argument that we were making was much harder to apply in situations where there's a lot more secrecy. Um, and there are some people who've, who've claimed that, it, that it's possible to, to use it there. I'm not entirely convinced, but I'm willing to be convinced. So, so my point being that the stuff that we wrote in that book is not the end of the story. It was just the end of our book. But there's a lot more that's been done since then, and you should look at it. And, and there, there, there are some people who've worked in insecurity areas, and I'm not sure how useful most of them have found us, but they're... Um, but so I so I'm not really in a position to answer your question. Um, it's great that you're finding it um, useful on the LGBT movement. Um, the same answer, in a sense, applies. There's a lot of other work that's been done since Keck and Sicking, um, which has become sort of this single word, the Keck and Sicking, <laughs> um, and. Uh, and it's worth taking a look at it. Uh, the last round uh, here. Yeah, um, I wanted to just return uh, for a moment to uh, the theme of the of the first question of the of this last round, which is um, how we talk about critical distance, um, because I know that's a very uh, uh, w between disciplines, it's a very fraught question. Yes. Um, I, um, of course, my 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 own advisor is very much a believer in, in in some ways of separating the political and the and and the in scholarship. Um, but he's writing a biography of Lula now, so he's finding that the challenges <laughs> of that to be uh, interesting as well. This is John French. Yeah. So, like, how do you write a biography of a person that's going through a political crisis when any, anything you write can, if it comes out at a particular moment, can influence a political situation, right? There's that, but um, I personally did my undergraduate and master's at University of Texas, Austin, in Latin American Studies, and at the time, the director was uh, Charles Hale, an anthropologist. And, mm -hmm. So we did a lot of, we read a lot about engaged, this sort of engaged research or activist research, et cetera. And the whole argument was that you, that, that trying to get critical distance is in and of itself a position. And that in some ways it doesn't, in some ways that one needs to acknowledge one's position vis-a-vis -vis the movement and make a, make a decision about uh, the goal you want, et cetera. So how do we, with the critical distance question, uh, how do we both acknowledge our position and the fact that we are taking a position, uh, whether or not we wish to do so, and a need for critical distance? What, what are the, for you, who have taken the side of critical distance, is there, um, are there advantages to engaged research, or do you think that it's a, you think that it's, it's solving a problem that's not necessarily there? Thank you. Sorry, that was long. Someone else? 
Mm. Hi, my name is Alexandre. I'm from the University of Belgrade. Uh, during my master, first of all, thank you for the lecture. And second of all, thank you, thank you for your book on democratization in Brazil was fundamental for my masters. Uh, so I, would like, I studied uh, the social movements in Brazil and Serbia after uh, democratization, their role. So I would like to, mm -hmm. I would like to, a broader question. Since we're seeing, uh, we can notice the right wing movement in Europe, Brazil, US, how do you see the role of social movements at the moment? And if you see if they are working towards trying to make a change or they are just trying to uh, withheld this wave of right-wing uh, movements throughout the world. Thank you. Anyone else? So we are gonna f finish now, so... Last chance, no. <laughs> okay. I think I like, for some reason I seem to like doing, answering questions backwards. Um, uh, that's great that the, that, that the book was helpful, and um, I think that the jury is out on, uh, I, I haven't actually, I, I read the newspapers, I read Facebook, and I read people's blogs, but I have not studied uh, the current wave of right-wing movements, they're tremendous, I think they're tremendously important. Um, I, I'm curious about uh, the networks that they're part of. Uh, in some places, they, they're clearly parts of, uh, there are, you know, in the United States, for example, there are some right-wing movements that are also part of big money, uh, highly well-financed kinds of networks, but there are other ones that aren't. And so I don't, I have not personally done research, nor have I read well, read thoroughly enough into the research that has been done to be able to kind of map these kinds of these things. But I think that it's tremendously important for people to be doing it. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, keep at it. Uh, engaged research, you know, as, as Hale says, you do you do take a position. I mean, and you 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 have to you have to retake that position all the time. I mean, I used the case of the Diadema chapter of, of my PT book. Um, that was one where uh, you know I had friends who were involved there. I had to remake my decision about what I was going to do again and again and again. Um, but I, I mean, I had made a sort of global decision, which is, I don't know that I would have sort of said, oh, I have decided to maintain critical distance from my subject. I just decided that, that it made sense to write the best thing I could, as opposed to uh, something that reflected my sympathies. However, it was also very clear um, and, and, and it's pretty clear if you read the book that, you know, my sympathies are there, uh, but they were, uh, I think that it would have been wrong if I had somehow written that book and said in the introduction, I have absolutely no connection with any of these people and don't care at all about any of this and so on and so forth. Um, that would have been wrong. That would have been essentially, that wouldn't have been critical distance, that would have been a lie. And so in that sense, I think Charlie's Hale, Charlie Hale's right. You do have to be clear about what your position is, but the fact that you know what your position is doesn't mean, doesn't necessarily define what you're going to do with it. I mean, in, you can decide, given any position that you take, you can decide to approach something in different ways. You can decide, I, I can't write about this because it's going to freak out too many of my friends, so I'm not going to write about it. Okay, does that mean that it's going to mess up your whole project and you should go and do something else? Maybe. Um, or does that mean that you can find a way to, to, to still do something that you can stand behind um, without 
doing that part of it. All of these are, are in, in qualitative research involving current actual human beings that you often develop relationships with and friendships and all of that kind of stuff. These kinds of questions are not answered once and for all. They're, they're answered over and over and over again. I personally believe that, um, that there's value to trying to, as much as possible, find a scholarly position that gives you a, a, a sort of broader view than you would have out of pure militancia. Uh, I mean, you know, if you wanted, it, it, there's, there's nothing wrong with being an activist. It's actually a really good thing. It gives me lots of people to write about in addition. But, um, you know, if you're going to be an activist, you should be an activist. You can be a scholarly activist who writes all kinds of, 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 of useful things. But if, you're, if your core goal in relation to a particular movement is to be an activist, then you should do that. I have to say that, you know, I, I've talked to John about about his book on Lula. And I don't, I don't know that I would have done it myself. I, I, I think that it, I would have found it difficult to write that book. And I frankly think he's finding it difficult to write that book too. Following up, following up the board, uh, just bringing it back to the general or even using this book as a jumping off for the follow up. Number one, do we have any sort of quote unquote accountability to the movements that have given us oh, that have given us access to them, or is that an implicit part of the deal that they know what they're getting into? And then se uh, second, what do you think are the inherent challenges of anyone by writing a biography like John is writing in any situation? I have actually, I I, I think that there's a. I generally think we have a kind of a Hippocratic duty. In other words, uh, if, you were, if you were doing research, uh, at the time that I was in graduate school, there were still a lot of dictatorships in Latin America and in lots of other parts of the world. And people who were doing studies in dictatorships were often especially people who were doing studies of op opposition groups and dictatorships, often found out stuff that would hurt people. And um, it was my view that you should not publish things that would, that, that would hurt people. And that, now that, obviously, that, you know, going back to your Charlie Hale thing, that's, that's a stance. But um, I was not willing to take the risk that something that I wrote could be used in a court um, by, by a, a, an authoritarian regime to put somebody that I had talked to uh, in a position of, of danger. Uh, so I avoided things like that. Um, and so that's, that's one place that I would draw the line. Um, I don't know, it's hard. Uh, what, do, what do we owe to the people that, uh, who, who, who we're studying? Um, we, I think, I have always felt that I owed it to people not to misrepresent what I was doing. That doesn't mean that they entirely understood what I was doing, probably, but I didn't, I haven't done research in which I pretended to be something that I wasn't. There are instances in which people do that and in which it makes actually a lot of sense to do that, but that requires a kind of methodological training, probably anthropological, that I have not had and that, and I'm not, I would not be comfortable um, in that kind of situation. I generally have tried, in the sense of accountability, I have generally talked about my research with people I have done research on um, and have often actually made efforts to do that, like organized meetings or, or you know, gone to people's houses for dinner and talked about it or, um, or things like that. 
Um, there's an entire tradition of action research in which the researcher is much closer um, and this is, a lot of this is related to sort of studies uh, of how um, scholars can be involved in trying to make governments accountable or, or corporations accountable or whatever. And so Jonathan Fox, for example, is currently heading up a, a, an institute on accountability at American University that's doing exactly that kind of research. And I think it's great. I think that it's 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 got a, it's tremendously valuable. Uh, it's a different kind of research than the kind of research that I'm talking about here. Um, it's quite explicitly research at the service of um, either particular ideals, um, i.e., sort of uh, transparency, um, or at the service of particular populations that are excluded generally from having access to information or from being able to influence uh, policymakers or people in power. So there are a lot of different kinds of research, and I haven't done all of them. So, and, and I'm not gonna actually talk any more about John's book because, because it's, we'll see how it comes out. Okay. Uh, so I would like to thank you very much, Professor Keck, for being with us today. She's going to be also tomorrow in the panel. And now we are going to stop for lunch. Should I say something else? Oh, we are going to be back at 2. Thank you, thank you all.